let's prepare ourselves now for the word of God. And we are continuing our reading this morning from the book of Revelation, the second chapter, and again from the New King James Version. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my namesake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. I like to speak this morning from the subject of staying in love with God. Staying in love with God. I've been in a teaching mode for three weeks now, and we've been chewing on this particular passage of scripture for those three weeks. And along with the message, we've been examining various aspects of prophetic scriptures and prophecies, particularly in the book of Revelation. And while this cannot be an exhausted study of the book of Revelation, and one day Uh, Perhaps we will, in fact, do that Uh, if we ever go to midweek services, which I do anticipate and hope for us to do. We would have more quality time to go through the various chapters and verses of the book of Revelation. Prophecy, as we said, is a fascinating topic. It peaks the curiosity of everyone, saint and sinner. It has all of the elements of drama, sci-fi, mystery. And as we said, because of the nature of prophecy, it also opens us up and makes us vulnerable to a wide range of speculation. And so, throughout the history of the church, there have been amazing interpretations of the book of Revelation, of the prophecies of the Bible. Some very profound and accurate, and many very somewhat ridiculous and have proven to be embarrassing and inaccurate. The study of prophecy is the theological fancy word for that is eschatology. And eschatology is basically the study of last things. The study of last things. It's where we get the word escalator from. It's as things progress. The other word that we looked at, another fancy word of hermeneutics, which is the art of interpreting scripture. 
you don't get to interpret scripture correctly just because you're born again. You can be saved and really love the Lord and still botch and hack Bible verses. So hermeneutics is the art of interpreting scripture. Some other words we looked at was eschegesis, which is drawing the meaning out of a text. That's what we want to do. We want to see what the text is saying to us. As opposed to eisegesis, which is inserting meaning into the text. And sadly, oftentimes, what happens is when we read the Bible and we attempt to interpret the scriptures, we end up putting things into the Bible that really are not there. This happens more so than anything with the subject of prophecy, and perhaps more so with any other book than the book of Revelation. Now, the book of Revelation is a series of visions and symbols, and they're quite fantastic, for some even scary, very bizarre, and you have these images, these various visions that John is seeing on the Isle of Patmos. And there's angels and there's demons and there's just all kinds of creatures. And there's all kinds of components and elements. And it leads us, leaves us to try to figure out what these symbols and visions mean. And that's why the art of hermeneutics is so important so that we don't in fact end up using our imaginations to interpret what the scriptures are saying. Remember, the book of Revelation is a revelation. It is intended to disclose to you truth. It's intended to unveil mystery to you, not conceal it. So he's not trying to hide things for you, to make things encrypted for your lack of understanding. He wants you to understand what's happening. The scriptures often uses symbols. We see this in Revelation. We see a vision. We see elements that are supposed to represent other things. These are symbols. It's not exclusive to revelation or prophecy. We see these in types. When the Bible says, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Well, he wasn't pointing to a sheep. He was pointing to Jesus. And so what it means is that there's something about a lamb that represents a truth about who Jesus is and who he was. And so with that simple illustration, the Lamb of God reminds us of the sacrificial lamb that the Jews would present to God for forgiveness of sins. So the symbols we used to point to other things. Parables were symbolic language. And at one time, they asked Jesus, why are you doing this? Why are you speaking in parables? Now, it's often been said that Jesus spoke in parables so that people could understand. He was talking to farmers, so he used stories about farming and sowing seeds and wheat and tares. He's talking to fishermen, so he talked about casting a net and ca catching a great catch. But that's really not what the scriptures say about parables. That's not why he, in fact, spoke in parables. And his disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? The answer was, Jesus answered, them to you. It has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, 
but to them it has not been granted. So what is he saying? He's not saying that he spoke parables to make things easy to understand. Quite the opposite. He spoke in parables because he wanted you to understand something and he didn't want them to get. So symbols are used in the scriptures to give us certain insights. Now why is this? Well, because one, Jesus has a message for his people. Another thing to understand is that the early church was a very persecuted church. And so when you are mapping out a war plan, you don't want the enemy to understand what you're doing. You don't want to show your hand. You want to and you need to give your people information for their survival and for their success. But you don't want the enemy to know what you're doing. So symbols were used for that purpose, to show the church something, to show the people of God something, and yet conceal it from those who would harm or attempt to hurt the people of God. We see this with the Pharisees. It says, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They didn't know what he meant. They didn't understand what he was saying. But he knew that what he was saying to the people, his people in parables, had something to do with them. So, why biblical symbols? Biblical symbols are designed to reveal the mysteries of the kingdom to the believer. Parables, types, visions, the book of Revelation. It is designed not to confuse you, not to scare you. It's designed to reveal to you things that Jesus wants you to know. To reveal the mysteries to the believer and keep them from the enemy. And this is why one of the hermeneutical principles we talked about was letting scripture interpret scripture. You see, the early church didn't have a hard time figuring out the parables or the book of Revelation because they knew the scriptures. And so when the scriptures used certain elements and symbols, they had a frame of reference. The unbeliever didn't know what it meant, but the people of the church, the people of God, who used that language all the time understood. So the symbols throughout the Bible, particularly in the book of Revelation, are explained somewhere else in the scriptures. When you let the scriptures interpret scriptures, you find out what the meaning of these visions mean. Many times, the revelation, the revealing of the symbols are right in the book of Revelation itself. We saw this with the seven candlesticks or lampstands. It says, as for the mystery of the stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Mystery solved. It tells you right there what the seven stars are. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So all you have to do when you want to find out what the visions and the symbols used in Revelation are about, you just have to go to other scriptures. Don't go to Fox News and try to interpret Revelation. Go to the scriptures and let the scriptures interpret the scriptures. Now, let's continue with some more hermeneutical principles. The book of Revelation talks about New Jerusalem. This is actually more like the Emerald City, but it, it was a fitting picture. Now, in the scriptures, when it talks about this New Jerusalem and the vision of heaven, we read things like, and the 12 gates were the 12 pearls. Now notice it wasn't the pearly gates. You often hear that we're gonna reach the pearly gates, but it doesn't say that. 
It's not the pearly gates. The gates are pearls. And it says, each one of the gates was a single pearl in the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Now, we've often heard that the city of God, heaven, is going to be with the streets of gold. And I've heard songs, we're going to walk the streets of gold. We're going to be in a place where the streets are made out of gold. But now, is that really what it says? Look again at what it says here. And the street of the city is pure gold. Not the streets. There's one street. Which brings us to another principle of interpretation. If it can be taken literally, then take it literally. How do you know when a symbol is a symbol or when it's supposed to mean something else? If it can be taken literally, then it's literal. If it can't be taken literally, then it must mean something else. So in that case, when it says that the, there you have a city, but the city only has one street, and that street's made out of gold. Well, that's kind of odd that a city would only have one street. So does the New Jerusalem and the description that we have of the New Jerusalem possibly mean something else? When we continue, we looked at Revelation 4. It says, immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sawdust stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in the appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. We talked about this last week, and we're going to continue with this particular vision. And here it says that around this throne, we talked about the stones, and we talked about the rainbow. Continuing, it says there was 24 thrones, and on them was 24 elders. So who or what are the 24 elders? Well, there have been much speculation and imagination of that. Some say that they are angels, but they could not be angels because Angels were never called elders, always men. Men were called elders. Angels were never granted to sit on thrones, always men. Angels were never promised crowns, always men. Angels were never given white robes. All of these things were promise to men. So they cannot be angels. That would be inconsistent with scriptures. So another popular theory is that they are the 12 apostles. But then you have 12 more to figure out because you have 24 to answer. So they say it was 12 apostles and 12 patriarchs. So that would be Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and I don't know who else. But you see what happens here is we are giving way to speculations, trying to match up or figure out what 24 elders are all about. So when we let scripture interpret scripture, we go to Revelations, the fifth chapter, the next chapter, it says this. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. 
Notice, by the way, it just interpreted for you what the bowl of incense were. They are the prayers of the saints. And they, the 24 elders, sang a new song saying. So now the 24 elders are singing a, a song. And this is what they say. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, and people and nation. You redeemed us and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. So here again, the scripture just interpreted the scripture, and the scriptures just told you the identity of these 24 elders. They are people that have been redeemed by the blood. They're saved people that are elected to reign with him. But why 24? Is it only 24? Well, let's look at it again. It says, you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue, and people, and nation. So these 24, it says, come out of every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation. If it can be taken literally, then take it literally. Even back then in the ancient world, there were more than 24 tribes, 24 peoples, 24 nations. So then the 24 cannot be a literal 24. It also proves why they can't be the apostles or patriarchs. It says that they come out of every tribe, tongue, nation, and people. Well, all of the apostles were Jewish. They were from Israel. So they cannot be the apostles. All of the patriarchs, whoever you might want to name, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jeremiah, Isaiah, any one of them, they were all Israelites. So it could not be them. These 24 represent every nation. So why 24? What does the number 24 mean? Well, that takes us back to the priest and the priesthood. The Bible talks about the tribe of Levi, which was selected for priesthood. And there were thousands of them. Those thousands were divided. It says this. This is how Aaron's descendants, that's the Levites, the priests, were divided into groups for service. So out of all the Levites, they were divided into groups. David divided Aaron's descendants into groups according to their various duties. Eleazar's descendants were divided into 16 groups, and Ithmiar's into eight. 16 and eight make 24. There were 24 divisions of the priesthood. The tribes were divided into 24 groups. Each group carried out its appointed duties in the house of the Lord. Now we actually see this in the New Testament with John the Baptist's father who was a priest. It says in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abiah. That's the eighth division. So John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, was in that division. And now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God, in the appointed order of his division. According to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So out of the priest, they were divided into 24 groups, and each group would take turns in servicing the temple. So we go back to the 24 elders. He says, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and have made us 
kings and priests. Thrones and crowns symbolize kings. 24 would symbolize the priests. We have been made kings and priests to the Lord. Again, in chapter 5, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. So the 24 elders is not a literal 24, but they represent believers who have been made kings and priests. But what particular believers? And this we look at in the timeline. Revelation occurs chronologically. And it says, after these things, this is the fourth chapter, after these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Well, after what? After these things, what things? Well, the first three chapters deal with the church. And we talked about that representing the church age. So now this here happens after the church age. And after chapter 3, you don't read about the church anymore. Everything now is taking place in heaven. And the things that occur on the earth, the church is absent. So here these things, the 24 elders are there after this. Well, carrying through in chapter 7, it says, After these things, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could number, of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So, the 24 elders appear after the church age, but they are there before the tribulation. So the 24 elders represent the raptured saints. Isn't anyone excited about this but me? <laughs> All right. Let's get to our text. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent. Do your first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove the lampstand from its place unless you repent. The problem with the church of Ephesus, with all of its good doings, and this was a church that seemed to have done everything right. If you had walked into this church, you would say, this church has it going on. This church is doing it right. It has good doctrine, good teachings. It doesn't take any junk. You try to pull something over on this church, and it will catch you. They're patient. They're faithful. They were doing things good. But it was on the outward appearance. On the inside, it wasn't good at all. On the inside, they had left their first love. Well, what does it mean to leave your first love? Now, if you were to ask, I venture to guess if you were to ask anybody, saint or sinner, do you love Jesus Christ? You'll get a yes. Not unless there's some devil worshiper or something. Yes, anybody. Do you love the Lord? Yes, I love the Lord. It's easy to say, I love the Lord. I love you. We even see this with Simon Peter. When Jesus asked him three times, and he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved 
because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Now, I actually find this somewhat comical, that Peter is annoyed because the Lord asked him three times, if you love me. Peter's annoyed. Why are you asking me this? You know I love you. Well, actually, just a matter of days ago, you were denying him three times, and you say you didn't even know him. And yet, Peter forgets that. I'm over that. I love you. It's easy to say, I love the Lord. And the church of Ephesus, no doubt, would have said, oh, yes, we love God. We love Jesus. Jesus is everything to us. We all have heard of the horrific stories of children that come from abusive homes. And all they know is battery, abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, and sometimes even sexual abuse. But a strange phenomenon that if you take any one of these kids away from the home, they're traumatized. They want to be in their home. They love their parents. And you say, how could someone love someone who's abusing them? But that's all they know about love. That's their frame of reference. For them, that is love. And so what you have here is a distorted view of love. A twisted kind of love. And oftentimes, children like this grow up into adults like that, where they're in unhappy circumstances, subject to verbal abuse, emotional abuse, and sometimes even physical abuse. But they say, I love him. So he smacks me around, but I love him. She neglects me and ignores me, but I love her. And what happens is you've now adopted and accepted and embraced a twisted kind of love because you've been led to believe that all the junk that you're going through is somehow love. Well, what happens when we grow up with that kind of mindset and now we come into the church? Well, what that means is we bring baggage into the church. We bring all of our distorted, twisted concepts of love. And now we try to fit that into loving God and him loving us. If you've been in love with someone who doesn't know how to treat you, then that's how you're going to view God. If you've been in a relationship that has been unhealthy, then that's the kind of love you're going to reflect toward God. So it's important for you to understand and grab hold what a godly kind of love looks like. Very popular verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have 
everlasting life. God so loved the world that he gave. The nature of love is giving. The nature of lust is taking. But the thing is, if you get two people, if you get two couples, one couple's in love, and the other couple is in lust. When they both come to the altar to get married, they both look the same. I'm preaching hard now. They both do the same things. They talk the same way. But there's a difference. Because one is in it for what they can give. The other couple is there for what they can get. Watch people in your life who only love you for what they can get from you. And this doesn't matter whether it's your spouse, your family, your friends, or even your church. You have pastors who only value you for what they can get from you, what you can do for them, what you can do for the church. The nature of love is to give. Unhealthy love is only there for what it can get. So they talk about loyalty, but what they mean is loyalty to them. They talk about faithfulness, but they talk about being faithful to them. There are people who don't love you. They love being in love. And there are people who just love to the idea of they're in love with somebody. And if it's not you, it would be somebody else. And they just love the idea of being in a relationship. They just love the idea of somebody loving them. They love the idea of being in love, but they can do that without necessarily loving you. Watch people who love you because they only love what you love. People who are in your life, not because they love you, they just happen to be for the very things that you're for. And it could even be the church. They're with you because they share a common goal. They're with you because they share a common interest. But that doesn't mean they love you. And you know this because as soon as you can't provide for them what they want, they'll leave you. As soon as somebody else can offer them something that will take them to where they want to go better than you, they will drop you like a hot potato. Because they love only what you love. Or you have people who are with you, not because they love you, they just hate the same things you hate. And so you get involved with these people. And if you're not watchful, if you're not prayerful, if you're not wise, you'll mistake these things for love. And worse off, you start to impose these things into and insert these things into your love for God. And you think the way people are treating you, that's how you should be treating God. And you think the way people have been treating you is the way God loves you. And so you see people who enjoy misery. They enjoy suffering because they think that's what love is all about. They're in a relationship and say, Yes, it's not a good thing, and yes, he's abusive to me. Yes, he mistreats me, but I know he loves me. And if that's your idea of God, then you'll start to think that God somehow enjoys seeing you suffer. You'll start to think that God somehow takes pleasure in your trials, that somehow him inflicting pain on you or allowing you to go through suffering somehow is a mark of how much he loves you. 
But I'm here to tell you that God is not interested in seeing you suffer because he has already suffered for you. He's not interested in seeing you or trying to kill you or hurt you because he has already had been killed for you. God is not looking to bring you down. He takes no pleasure in seeing you depressed. He takes no pleasure in seeing you go through trials. He takes no joy in seeing you hurt and suffer. Doesn't mean that things are always going to go your way. It doesn't mean that problems are not going going to come your way but you should never take those things and interpret them that somehow this is the love of God in my life if you have these kinds of twisted distorted ideas hallelujah you will start to think that that's the kind of love that God has for you but I'm here to tell you that God has the love he says that I know my thoughts for you I have everything in mind for you I have healing for you the kind of love that God has for you is joy like a river that always flows he's looking for when you are sick he wants to be there to pick you up when you feel you have nowhere else to run to that's the kind of love that God God has for us who says you can come my way and cast all your cares upon me because he cares for you we love him because he first loved us and because he first loved us we know how he loves us and we know how to love him don't look and see the people that have caused you hurt and have caused you harm but you have to have this kind of love so when you think that God is deserting you you say I'm going to stay in love with God and even when I'm confused even when things don't go my way I'm going to stay in love with God and even when it seems I'm falling apart and I'm falling away from God I'm going to reach out and hold on to him anyway and keep falling in love with God over and over again if I have to pray all night I'm going to stay in love with God if I have to turn down my plate and go on a fast I'm going to stay in love with God. If I have to repent for something that I said or something that I did, I'm going to stay in love with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.